nowhere in America are you going to drive around and all of a sudden you see a leg in the middle of the road that is cut off from like the knee down, just blown off. There's just a leg there. And I could see the hairs on, on the leg down to the ankle. So sometimes when I'm putting on my socks in the morning, I think about a fucking dismembered leg sitting in the middle of the road that I drove by one day in Iraq from some poor guy that decided to freaking get in front of us. Violence is a necessary part of combat. And that is something every Marine understands when they step foot on the yellow footprints that first day of boot camp. Few people crave it outright, but they all accept the very real dangers endemic to service, even when they join during peacetime. Once the war is on, though, it becomes necessary to embrace the danger and violence and lose your sense of self for the greater good. But really, accepting your mortality is on some level the easiest part. Acknowledging the mortality of your brothers and sisters is another thing altogether. After all, protecting yourself is only valuable insofar as it helps protect others. Right? I started smelling those Hellfire missiles. You would just smell, it smelled like barbecued something, but it wasn't nothing you've ever smelled before. And then you hear the gunfire in the nighttime, and then you hear explosions happening going all over the place. And you just, you just know that now we're in the thick of something. Something's like, there's serious consequences to this. Like people are getting medevaced out of here. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. Military service has always provided opportunities to people who want a way up and out. For Luis Garcia Jr., though, it wasn't really an option at first. His folks were determined that he make the grades for and succeed in college, and while he did the first, he was unable to complete the second. He was way more interested in partying than studying, and when he flunked out of San Francisco State, he burned through a series of dead-end jobs before he found his calling. A buddy of mine, he decided to join the Marine Corps. He comes back three months later in a pair of dress blues, and I was sold right then, because at the time I was kind of on my own. And when I seen him in the, that uniform and he was telling his stories about boot camp, it got me excited. I was like, let's go up, talk to the recruiter right now. And we went up and he introduced me to the recruiter and I just told that dude, go ahead, you know, let's, let's do this, sign me up, I'm ready to go. He wasn't though, at least not right away. Although he conspired with his recruiter to beat the system, Lewis failed a drug test and would have to wait. But at least now he had a plan, something to focus upon. He cleaned up and, when the opportunity presented itself for him to enter in an open contract, which is the Marines' version of undeclared, he jumped at it. Of course, in the Marines, undeclared means that they'll choose a vocation for you. So by the time he arrived at MCRD San Diego, Lewis was slated to become a motor transport operator, essentially a truck driver. It wasn't a job he would have chosen, but it met his criterion of being a career that got him out of Crockett, California. But even without a war on the horizon, there is something awe-inspiring about stepping off the bus and beginning your journey as a United States Marine. You're afraid, and you're exhilarated, and you wonder how it's all going to go. Then the drill sergeants start screaming at you, and they keep screaming for the next 12 weeks. When I left for boot camp, I think I weighed like 185 and I came out of boot camp weighing about 130 or 135 to where my family didn't even recognize me. Like I'm sitting there standing in front of my mom and dad and they're like looking around for someone and I'm like, dude, I'm right here, you know? 
I, I was just so thin. I was so fit coming out of boot camp. It was crazy. It was it was a little hellish at the time, and little did I know that that was like the easiest thing that you could do in the Marine Corps is boot camp. To be clear, boot camp isn't the least physically demanding, but it is the last time you can proceed without thought, when you are completely and utterly present, when there is always a task. Lewis trained at the Army base at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, but eventually returned to Camp Pendleton as part of Bravo Battery, 1st Battalion, 11th Marines. It was an artillery unit. They hauled and helped operate one of the 155 howitzers. This meant a lot of training and a lot of time in the field, sitting with the guns, shooting, and moving. Lewis got married at a drive through Vegas wedding, as much on a whim as anything else. And when his first deployment started in July 2001, he said goodbye to his wife and boarded the troop carrier bound for Darwin, Australia. They landed in early September. And we were out partying that night. And I remember in Darwin, there was like a casino there and there's a bunch of bars and we were out gambling and partying and we were just getting wasted. It was a good time. And then all of a sudden, the shore patrol, which is Navy and Marine Corps guys on duty, they were coming around, rounding everybody up, telling everybody to get back to the ship. We we're like, well, what's going on? They're like, they just bombed the World Trade Center. Someone just hit it. They flew, someone blew it up. We're like, what the, f- what the hell? They are like, yeah, right. They are like, no, they hit that and they hit the Pentagon. And we we're like, oh, you're full of shit. We we're drunk, you know, and uh, we're just like, no way, no way. How's somebody going to do that? How's somebody going to blow up the Pentagon and the World Trade Center all in one shot? You know, both towers at the time they were telling us. There's just no way. We all just come back and we called bullshit on the whole. We just figured that they didn't want us out partying, that we needed to come back to the ship. And we all went to sleep and woke up in the morning and they have the armed forces network on the ship. And we were already moving. We were already out at sea. And it was showing footage of the, the World Trade Center coming down. So it was true. It's September 12th, 2001. And while the rest of the world is still in shock, the Marines were bound for Afghanistan. Pakistan, actually. It was a really weird time for many of the deployed military. Because while for a lot of the civilian and the military leadership, a massive military response was needed, necessary, and appropriate, precisely what kind of response still was in question. But the USS Dubuque gathered up its crew and its Marines and went barreling toward the Indian Ocean where very little happened. It just felt weird. I don't know. It was so short. It was like nothing happened. We we geared up. We didn't even take the guns off the ship. And and we just got back on. We spent a few months like doing squares in the Indian Ocean, just sailing around. And then finally we offload and we're out there for like 30 days. And then we just get back on and leave. And that was the extent of my first sea service deployment. While they had set the table for an eventual invasion, establishing a desert airstrip in Pakistan and securing supply lines, there was still no war to fight, and there wouldn't be for another few weeks. In late November, conventional forces would invade using that airstrip and establish Camp Rhino. But for now, Lewis and the rest of the Marines made their way back to Australia and then home, where the buzz was already starting about their next deployment. And we were getting off the ship, I remember. And then you just started hearing these weird little rumors about Iraq and Saddam. That's that's what we started hearing when we got back from that deployment in 2002, you know, early. We got back and we started going back out to the field and training all over again. Some guys were getting out. It was kind of a, a little bit of a changeover period for that unit at the time. So I had only been in the Marine Corps for maybe, you know, two years at the time. And all the other guys that were already at the unit, a lot of them were were EASing, end of active service. So they were getting out and we were hearing stuff about Iraq and that we were training for that all of a sudden, out of nowhere. In retrospect, it is really easy to see where the escalation was heading. But as late as December 2002, the war in Iraq was still under debate both in the U.S. and among the larger international community. But for many of the U.S. military leaders, the writing was on the wall. 
Moreover, it is important to remember that training for war is one of the United States Marines' top responsibilities. But at the time, training for a large-scale invasion always felt a little bit more like a thought experiment. But we were already in Afghanistan, and escalation seemed to make a little bit more sense. The U.S. was entering a new era in its military history, and with that came the uncertainty of future deployments. It was pretty big. The commanding general was talking to us, and I remember him. he was telling us that we were getting ready to go on Christmas leave and that we needed to, to have a good time. He told us, hug your loved ones and make peace with God because we're going to end up going to Iraq. I remember sitting in formation, and I was like, God damn, this guy knows something. He must know something, you know, if he's, he's sitting there telling us that. And uh, we went on leave for Christmas and got back, and it was just full scale. We're, we're going to leave. I found out on Christmas leave, someone, I remember someone calling me, and they were saying, when, you, there's not going to be any leave extensions, and you, when, when, when you get back, we're shipping out. So you need to tell, tell your family and stuff like that. I don't remember it being awkward at the time because I was so stressed. You know, at that point, the last place I wanted to go was Iraq. I didn't want to have nothing to do with that because the guy was infamous for using chemical weapons, you know? that's That scares me more than anything, is getting hit in a chemical attack. And I was pretty sure at the time that I was going to die in a chemical attack in Iraq. I remember just having stress. I was just stressed, you know, just trying to... I was only 20, 21 or 22 at the time, you know. When it first became clear to him that going to war was a legitimate possibility, that one way or another he would at least be deployed to the Kuwaiti desert, Lewis felt his mortality, which is a rare feeling for someone in their early 20s. It's also important to remember how present the discussion of chemical weapons were. Saddam Hussein had used them on the Iraqi Kurds just a little more than a decade before, and the threat seemed both real and likely. What Lewis didn't consider, though, was that there was more to be afraid of than dying. And, after the initial shock, the full weight of his impending deployment came down upon him. Once it registered, it would change his outlook as a Marine and as a man as well. There are a few things as tedious as making an appointment and then going to the doctor's office just to get permission to get something you know will make your life a little better. You feel like, as an adult, you should be able to say, here's my problem, and get the solution that you need, and that you know is available. Take hair loss, for example. When you start to notice hair loss, it's too late. It's easier to keep the hair you have than to replace the hair you've lost. If you know you're one of the two-thirds of men likely to experience hair loss, and it's something you want to prevent, why not be able to get a prescription without spending that whole day at the doctor's? This is the main problem the company Hims was trying to solve when they launched ForHims.com. The idea was to take common, easily diagnosed issues for men and take away the anxiety and tedium of going to the doctor. It's more than just hair loss that we know can be reduced or even avoided. ED starts to become an issue for 40% of men over 40, and that number just goes up with age as well. Both of these issues have scientific solutions. That is, medicine, not herbal solutions or any other kind of snake oil. But for a really long time, it was tough to get your hands on medical solutions. It isn't anymore. A U.S. board-licensed doctor reviews it and writes a prescription based on your personal requirements and needs. Then HIMSS fills the prescription and sends it along in discreet packaging. That's it. Check out the 4 website to get a sense of what kind of company they are. The site has plenty of lifestyle articles from men's writers with insights on everything from cocktails to grooming. It's a great site to read. Order now. My listeners get a trial month of HIMS for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash this is war. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash this is war. For dot com slash this is war.
After the initial shock that deployment was imminent and that it could very well be followed by a ground war that included chemical attacks, Lewis started to gain a little perspective on the situation. He was, after all, a United States Marine, built and trained for combat and a part of the greatest fighting force the planet had ever seen. He would face what need to be faced, support his comrades and do whatever was required of him. But it wasn't until they were getting ready to leave that the other shoe dropped. Remember, in January 2003, there was no recent precedent for a buildup and invasion. There was some precedent for shipping out into harm's way, but no salient cultural shift to deal with sending husbands and sons, wives and daughters abroad to fight. The U.S. military was equipped for war, but the citizenry had not yet even begun to establish a united home front infrastructure. Man, I remember, like, everybody was coming down to see me leave. So, I remember my parents came down. I think my brother was there. My my wife was there for sure. And we were just outside of the barracks in Camp Pendleton on Las Pulgas. I remember the white buses pulled up, and we were going to go to March Air Force Base and fly out. And from there, I didn't know where we were going. But I remember it, it was just kind of like the thing when you're... If you've ever had to tell somebody goodbye and if it was going to be like for real like this is this is goodbye and that's that's kind of the the atmosphere of everything and it 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 definitely it affected everybody you know there was there was no tough guys on that bus there was everybody was emotional and scared we didn't know if we were coming back you know so it was that was kind of the the vibe that was going on at that time and then come to find out you know my dad ends up breaking out in hives and it's just rough it's when you deploy you don't just it's not just you leaving you know you're leaving behind people that that love you and care for you and you just don't know if you're going to see them again and it I, I don't know how to explain that feeling to you without you you would have to experience it. There's no there's no feeling for how, how to describe it, you know. When you're a member of the armed forces, every pre-deployment goodbye is a real one. It isn't something people get used to or take for granted. What Lewis started to realize and what he would come to fully understand as his deployment continued was that he wasn't alone in his decision to join the Marines. His family was affected, just as were the families of all of the other young men deploying with him. It wasn't just about missing his wife and folks, it was about putting himself in their place when the knock came on the door, and there was a marine in dress blues on the other side waiting with his condolences. The internet was barely a thing at the time, so the last time anyone would see anyone's face or hear their voice was before climbing those stairs and taking their place on the bus. Of all the things they expected and prepared for, the one aspect of an invasion this battery unit wasn't ready for was the boredom. And there was as much boredom as there was sand in the Kuwaiti desert for the first 99 days of 2003. The Marines would set up the guns, wait a few days, break them down, move them, and set them up somewhere else, with nothing to do with the time in between than behave like 20-year-olds with too much time in their hands. Bullshit and playing cards, d- dirty jokes, freak, anything you can think of, any kind of crude field humor, beating people up. People got beat up all the time, tying up people, hog tying people, tape them up. It was an all male unit at the time. So we got away with a lot of stuff that usually you wouldn't get away with in a mixed gender unit. We'd be out in the middle of the field, all of our guns set up, and you got cami netting. Next thing you know, a guy's running by in just a flak jacket. That's it. Just a flak jacket on, just screaming with his flak jacket and his M16, sprinting across the gun line. That's that's our day out there. They also listened to the radio, and with not a lot of information coming from the top, the news from the BBC seemed to suggest that without the support of the international community, the invasion might be scrubbed. Hearing it back, like hearing it at the time, it's very difficult to believe. Few people in the U.S. thought in their hearts that there would be no invasion of Iraq. 
and it was probably the case in the hearts of the Marines as well. But Lewis maintained the belief that they might one day just get orders to pick up their things and go home. After all, that's what happened when they were scrambled into Afghanistan 18 months before. The feeling for me and a lot of other guys that I was talking to at the time, we didn't think we were going there until we heard the bombs hit on Safwan Hill. Until I woke up that morning, heard the bombs in the distance, then I knew we were, we were going to war. It was on. Shock and awe, then, was a two-way street for Luis Garcia. But as a battery just over the Iraq-Kuwait border, they started getting orders and joined in with the initial bombardment. If you've never seen a howitzer operation, it is truly something to behold. Five or six Marines coordinate the setup and firing, toting an endless line of massive two-and-a-half-foot-long projectiles and loading them, charging with gunpowder, aiming, firing, and repeating. At peak speed and coordination, there are only minutes at most between volleys. Training makes the coordination second nature, so exhausted and in the dark and overnight, the bombardment can continue. They told us that we were going to be moving out. We were going to be moving closer to the border. I think we got one fire mission before that, and a fire mission, you know, telling us basically where we need to put our rounds from the position we were in. So somebody must have tried to jump a little bit early on the Iraqi side because we got one fire mission, and then we left, I remember. And we just kind of fired all night. I remember that. We were just firing... These long-range, freaking rocket-propelled rounds with these big charges. I remember sitting out there seeing you'd see the the rounds coming out of the gun, and then you just see a little light, and it, it almost looked like some Star Wars stuff. The way it, it was just falling, then you see the rocket start falling, and then it would just disappear. So I don't know what we were shooting at. We were never told, but we did a lot of firing that first night while everybody was crossing into Iraq. So they basically had everybody go in, and then we kind of came up the tail after that night. I remember we left kind of more towards the morning time. It was still dark, but it was starting to get light out. As the United States marched seemingly unopposed toward Baghdad in the first dizzying days of the war in Iraq, Lewis had the sense that this was not going to be a fair fight or a long war. Along the route, they were sometimes beset by people surrendering. In the distance, they could see the pickup trucks the Iraq army was using to recapture and execute deserters, but there was nothing that could be done for it. The invading force continued to push through, passing the carnage they'd wrought the night before, or that had been visited upon Iraq by the first push of Marines toward Baghdad. And we drove by like a van. So what these guys were kind of doing is they were filling up roadblocks and stuff with civilians and I, they were firing out of the top so I don't know if whoever blew that bus up knew that there was civilians I don't even know if I knew there were civilians in there but it, out the front of the bus there's somebody was trying to get out and they didn't make it so half of this guy's hanging from his entrails out the front of the bus off of a piece of broken glass and like kind of hitting the ground and then I remember driving through the side of the bus and somebody was trying to get out through the window and and was the, the window was too small and seeing the fucking look on that burnt skeleton you could see a grimace of somebody that was like wailing in pain and that just I was like holy fuck man I don't wish that upon anybody there was a guy that was on the road and he had been run over so many times that he looked like ketchup and pudding. This is the only way I could put it. Like everybody was running this guy over and we, we called him pudding guy because some dude ran out in the middle of the road and got killed and the rest of the U.S. military decided to run him over that day to make him unrecognizable. It's just shit you don't see when you're 20 years old or you're driving down the street. Throughout the big push, as he drove past each shock and awe tableau, Lewis vacillated between gallows humor, intense national pride, and the nagging realization of his part in that, and the conflict that all of that stirred within him. It wasn't guilt, not at all. Not that he didn't feel as if he were immune from guilt, but so often guilt is tied directly to intention, and his intention was to do his job and serve his country. Still, 
It wasn't as if he felt exonerated, only that he knew he had to get through each grueling hour in the desert until it was time to go home. It wasn't until much later that Lewis was able to take stock of his experience. So it was, it was kind of just like a conflict in my head. You knew you had to fight because that's the only way. The, the, these people don't stop shooting at you unless you shoot back at them. So if you want to die, you don't have to fight. But it's even to this day, you know, like the morality of the whole situation that I even took part in is in question in my head because I don't know how many people I killed. I didn't directly shoot anybody when I was there, but I guarantee I pulled the the string on that artillery cannon how many times, and those 100-pound bombs were going somewhere. It was the gravity of it, the creeping realization that there was a larger cost than just combatants. He didn't want to die, but he was a Marine and understood that that might eventually be his lot. But the way the war had spread to civilians on both sides of the conflict, the loss that would have to be endured by the people at home was something he was still having trouble shaking and contact with living Iraqis only added to his ambivalence. And we put our guns away, and they told us that we're going to be a provisional rifle company, and we're going to be going out doing patrols and just doing peacekeeping inside this, a certain sector of Baghdad that 11th Marines got tasked with. They're sending us out on day and night patrols into Baghdad, which wasn't too bad because at that time, People loved us. So we would be patrolling the city. And I remember specifically one lady flagged me down. She stopped me and she had some bread and she had some food and drink. And she came out and gave us all this stuff. And I, I remember looking at the sergeant at the time. I was a corporal. I was like, man, is this cool? And he was like, ah, you know, we don't want to be rude. And uh, we, we ate the bread. And this lady, the, all she was concerned with, when is the power coming back on? Bombs are going off everywhere, and these people just want their power back on. And we couldn't answer that question, but everybody kind of loved us. When major combat operations ended and Lewis made his way home, it was more of the same. Parades and congratulations, but at arm's length. His family was happy to see him home and safe, and when they heard he would re-enlist as his contract ended, they took the news as well as could be expected. What was tough for him, though, was trying to reintegrate socially. This invasion was unlike anything most people had seen in their lifetimes. And, having come up in a world without major U.S. deployments that also were so well covered, people wanted to get a better sense of what was going on. This wasn't like Desert Storm. There was a two-front war going on that, by the middle of 2004, was clearly morphing into something more than just retaliatory strikes in response for September 11th. And people were interested, or so they thought, they were asking him what it was like, but they were asking him the way you might ask a stranger how they're doing, with the expectation of a one-word answer that cemented their belief that everything was just fine. It was good to be home. I remember it being real good to be home, but at the same time, it was... Everything was kind of different. It felt weird, you know? I got people asking me all kinds of questions about what was it like out there? And then I'd tell them a story and they would, they'd look at me funny, you know? Because I, I, I told them what happened. I told them a story. Like if I told anybody else that I was driving by and saw a leg out in the middle of the road, the average person does not want to hear that. They look at you funny. And if you say something, and I know some people deal with this terrifying shit with humor, you know, like they'll be laughing. I've had a lot of dudes telling you, I saw the dude got mowed in half and half of them fell over here. And then something funny happened with these. He kept running. His legs kept running and they're fuck cracking up. You know, that's funny for me sometimes, but that's not funny for Janice, the freaking school attendant. You know, she doesn't want to hear that. She thinks you're crazy. And as the war dragged on into 2005, the insurgency started in earnest. Members of the military and citizenry alike would have to begin to come to terms with the new normal, which included perpetual war and all of its trappings. We learned not to ask too many questions of veterans, as much because we didn't want to hear as because we didn't want to make them tell. When he re-enlisted, Lewis decided to change units. He wasn't trying to avoid deployment. He was really just trying to introduce normalcy into his time at home. Driving for a battery meant that even when you were home, you spent a lot of time in the field, 
training for weeks to perfectly execute the coordination it took to fire that howitzer. He eventually landed a logistics-oriented job for his next deployment. The work would be marginally safer, but more important, when his deployment was over, he could look forward to sleeping at home every night, rather than in a field somewhere. Once Lewis arrived in post-insurgency Iraq, though, he would gain an insight into the casualties of war that would change him forever and cement his decision to end his military career. I've been a Dollar Shave Club member for a couple years now. I got the executive razor, which was a lot more razor than I needed because I don't have to shave every day. But it has this trimmer edge on top that makes it a little easier to get in under my nose. For me, though, the best part was that I never had to treat myself to a sharp razor and a clean shave. That just became part of the way I lived. Plus, it was cool knowing there was always another blade available and that there were more on the way. I didn't have to remember to go get one, which is great because there aren't any worse chores for me than going to the store. After a couple months, my wife wanted a subscription as well. She gets twin blades every other month because that's an option available for people who don't burn through razors really quickly. More recently, they sent along a couple of sample sizes of their other products. In addition to razors, Dollar Shave Club has shave butter, shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, everything you need to look, smell, and feel your best. After trying their lavender body wash, I switched and added it to my subscription. It isn't heavy or perfumey, just clean. I was convinced because it negated the YMCA chlorine smell that lingers on my skin after my workout. The best part for me, though, is once you find the products you like, you can just get them. I always feel a little stupid standing in the soap aisle trying to find the one thing that I always use. Dollar Shave Club sends me as much as I need when I need it. They're always the products I already know I like, so there's no confusion or running out. You don't have to set foot in a store, wandering the aisles, hunting for more razors, shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, none of it. Test drive everything they have, you're definitely going to find something that you like. And here's a great way to try a bunch of Dollar Shave Club's products. For just five bucks, you can get their Daily Essentials Starter Kit. It comes with body cleanser, one wipe Charlie's, their amazing butt wipes, their famous shave butter, and their best razor, the Six Blade Executive. Keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month, and add in shampoo, toothpaste, or anything else you need. Check it all out at dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. There are lots of reasons people stay in the military for 20 years, and twice as many for people who leave after four, but to re-enlist, especially during wartime, only to leave after a second four years as a Marine is a little less common, and it's often tied to pretty specific circumstances. Lewis had joined hoping to acquire a trade. Then he stayed as much because he couldn't imagine rejoining civilian life as because there was a predictability to his service. But even as he re-enlisted, the gray areas, the unknowns of deployment, the separation from his family, his responsibility to them as well as to his country and his comrades and the conflict in the places where these two commitments crossed began to wear on him. When I left, my, my wife at the time was like three months, three months pregnant. And I would just be back and forth from the phone center there because they had phone centers established at that time. Just kind of wait, just checking to see did my wife make it to the hospital yet? Oh, she's in the hospital. Well, she's going into labor, and I was just kind of calling back and forth, and finally I called at like the minute, one minute before my son was born. So I'm on the phone talking to my mom, who's in a Air Force base up in Fairfield, California, while my son's being born, but I'm in Iraq, like listening to a little baby crying. Like, I can't be there, you know? Not that I could do it. I found out many years down the road that it doesn't matter if I'm there or not, really. You know, your wife's going to do what she's going to do and have the baby. I felt powerless at the time because I, I don't get to hold my kid. I don't know what he looks like. There wasn't, I didn't have a cell phone. There wasn't Instagram and Snapchat and shit like that. So I remember getting off the phone and then I went to bed. The whole game changed. Now I have a kid, you know, I have a kid. 
People are dying over here still. I, I'm like, man, I have to get out of the military. It was the last straw for Lewis, but not just because he was a father. After all, he had known he was going to be a father when he left. The thing was, during the first part of this safe deployment, he had seen something that brought into strong relief the real and far-reaching dangers that are wrapped up in everything from kicking in a door on patrol to taking a helicopter home. We knew that there was, there was supposed to be two CH-53 helicopters coming in, and it was pretty like in the middle of the night kind of flight because most of the travel that they wanted to do around there was at nighttime because these guys, they'll, they'll shoot rockets at you. And all of a sudden, we see one of them coming in, and it's coming in. It's dipping. It's all fucked up. We were like, what is going on with that pilot? And it landed kind of hard. And I remember, like, some guy came flying out of that, that helicopter and grabbed that pilot up and just slammed him up against the side of the freaking helicopter. And I was like, dude, there's some shit going on over here. Because that second helicopter, we heard initially that it came under fire and it got hit, and it crashed maybe, you know, 15 or 20 miles out. So one of the helicopters that went down, there was 30 Marines in there that lost their lives. Um, and come to find out, pretty sure it was just like a bad tailwind. But it wasn't the capriciousness of the deaths so much as the fact of them that stirred Lewis. He had seen violent death. He had been part of some of the most brutal parts of the invasion and had experienced the loss that is part and parcel of being a Marine. But when he went to recover the helicopter, long after the bodies had been removed, the true cost of the war was made clear to him, so that, once his son was born, he couldn't in good conscience continue to serve. He owed too much elsewhere. I think they went out to the scene initially, like pretty much right away, and determined that nobody survived the crash. And then they had to send a team out there to retrieve all the bodies. And then the next day after that, they wanted to retrieve the helicopter. So that we, we had to go out there, and it was, it was tough. Because at the time, I wasn't thinking about it. I was thinking about how are they going to strap a helicopter on a seven-ton? It, it, it just it didn't make sense. I thought it, it was goofy. It was dangerous. I thought it was... I just remember thinking it wasn't the best idea for me to even go out there and, and retrieve anything. But when I, I got out there and they, they picked up the bodies, they picked all that up, but they didn't pick up people's personal stuff. There were still packs laying around. There were still gear and flak jackets and boots and I didn't know anybody on that airplane or that helicopter. I didn't know one person. But it's so tragic to to I was just sitting there rife like trying to his left on his contract and no real plan for what he would do once his service was over. When he got out in 2008, the economy was in shambles and would only get worse. He and his wife moved in with his parents while he looked for work. His hope was to get into a union, but by the time he was working and they could move out on their own, his marriage was beyond repair. He was divorced and intermittently unemployed, which, he said, was the perfect opportunity to throw himself a five-year-long pity party. I got out 100% Marine with the same freaking attitude and everything, that you're going to show me respect, this is how I do shit, I don't take a lot of talk back. That shit don't fly out here. People don't respond to that. You know, I had to completely change my way of thinking when I got out and it was the toughest thing to do. People don't know me from fucking anybody and they don't care. I'm just another average dude driving down the street. Although he was eventually able to join the electricians union and joined a few veterans groups where he could speak with like-minded people, Lewis had this uncontrollable rising bitterness over the way things had gone since his separation from the Marines. Somehow, he had thought things would be better, or at least not harder, and he couldn't reconcile the fact that they weren't, and he couldn't stand the fact that he couldn't impose order on his life. I hadn't done drugs. 
I dabbled a little bit here and there, but I hadn't really done anything serious since I was in high school. And I remember somebody giving me some of these little yellow pills and I popped one of them and I felt so good. I remember getting a little burst of energy. I got a little euphoria. I felt like it didn't matter that no one no one cared that I sacrificed how much stuff for this country, Christmases and time with my family and pretty much my marriage and now I'm not working. All that bitterness and all that pity party shit that I was putting myself through just like vanished when I took these drugs. I remember that. And it was as simple as that. Luis Garcia went from an angry vet who felt as if he'd been forgotten to a mostly upbeat addict with a good job in a matter of weeks. The thing was, he honestly didn't make the connection until he ran out of pills. And I got to work that day and it felt like I had the flu. I remember I felt so sick. I was bent over. I was, I had diarrhea. I like couldn't work. And I was like, what is going on? I, I just didn't know what was going on. And I started looking up shit on my phone and found out that I, I'm in withdrawal and that you're probably addicted to these pills and stuff. And I was like, there's no fucking way. I'm just sick. But I was like, you know what? Let's, let's see. We'll test this out. So I called somebody up. I bought like 10 or 15 more of those pills. I ate two of them and all that sickness dissolved. And I said, oh, fuck. I said, this is definitely a problem. And from that point on, for the next four years, I would do anything for pain pills. Just pain pills. That's my life, you know? my life pain pills pain pills upon pain pills and I just I couldn't get I couldn't stop it took years and then I finally got hit with a drug test at work and failed it and the union basically told me that I could either keep my job and go to rehab or I could keep doing drugs and not be a union electrician With the help of his now wife, then girlfriend, Sherry, Lewis got into an outpatient program and got himself clean. He made his peace with his service and with himself. Today, he continues to learn to be patient, or at least to try. Dealing with loss and disappointment is part of the human experience, and if you can't bring your expectations in line with a realistic picture of your life, it can consume you alive. Believe me, there's been bumps and fucking craters along the way that we've had to deal with, but, you know, the drugs aren't the issue anymore. Now we just have a 15-month-old baby that's wreaking havoc on our lives. You don't have to fear for your personal safety to find yourself in the grips of dread. You only have to be able to imagine a future where you don't exist. Where the people who count on you today no longer can and where everything you've done up to now is all you're ever going to do. Luis Garcia was driven by his commitment to others, to his family, to his unit, but inflicting that kind of responsibility comes at a price. You need to know going in that empathy, by definition, is a one-way street. If you don't, when you dig down, all you're going to find is anger and a sense of betrayal and abandonment. And then the only thing you can feel is sorry for yourself. Next time on This Is War. There's so much going on. It's hard to process and you almost don't. You know, because if you think about it, And you go on another mission, if that's where your head's at, that complacency or that fear is where people make mistakes. Subscribe to This Is War on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you're listening right now. If you're listening on an iPhone, just say, hey Siri, subscribe to This Is War. For show notes and more information, simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see offers from our sponsors. Please help support our shows by supporting them. Another way you can help support This Is War is by giving us a five-star rating and review or by following This Is War on social media. And be sure to tell your friends and show them how to subscribe. Are you a combat veteran or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service and a brief description of the story you'd like to share. I'm Anthony Russo. 
This is War was produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery. Thank you.